Hello, you're listening to Second on the Mount, a podcast of sermons from Second Presbyterian Church, located on Mountain Avenue in Roanoke, Virginia. We are glad you found us. My name is Elizabeth Link, and I'm the executive pastor. Each week, we climb into the pulpit with a bit of fear and trembling. We hope and pray that what we have to say is true to God's will for the church and may encourage and challenge you on your journey of discipleship. Please rate and review if you enjoy. May the Spirit have some word for you in what we have to share. Our scripture reading comes from the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. And you will see in your bulletin that it is a rather long passage. So I encourage you to actually open your pew Bibles and follow along, or else you might get lost in the details. Although, by having you read along with me, I run the risk of you finding out that I will mispronounce some of the names of some places, but I'll proceed with confidence. So turning in your pew Bibles to the Old Testament page of 232, we'll be reading from 1 Samuel chapter 17. We'll read most of the chapter, but I'll skip a few verses here and there. So let us listen now for the word of God. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. They were gathered at Soka, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soka and Azekah in Ephesdamon. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armored with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had greaves of bronze on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, Today I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now skipping ahead to verse 19. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. David rose early in the morning, left someone in charge of the sheep, took the provisions, and went as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the encampment, as the army was going forth to the battle line, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage, ran to the ranks, and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. Now continuing in verse 32, David said to Saul, let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for you are just a boy and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor, and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. 
Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk in these, for I am not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi, which is river, and put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand." When the Philistine drew near to meet David, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell down to the ground. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I cannot remember the first time I heard this story. It's one of the stories I've just always known. It was in my children's storybook Bible. Countless faithful Sunday school teachers illustrated it on felt boards. And the Veggie Tales version of this story lives rent-free in my brain, with a little asparagus David singing defiantly to a giant pickle Goliath, you're big, but God's bigger. And I bet if you grew up in or around church or a synagogue, this is a story you've heard before, too. No wonder. It's a story rife for illustrations. A boy and his slingshot. A menacing giant decked out for battle. We love stories of young David. Before he grew up and made, shall we say, less than desirable choices. We love picturing him with the sheep and his harp, the youngest of all his brothers, and yet somehow the bravest. And we remember that according to scripture, God calls David the man after my own heart. But when we revisit this rather grisly scene with a more grown-up lens, we see it's pretty violent, right? Were we to read on past verse 48 into verse 49, we would read how David actually not only slays the warrior Goliath, but then cuts off his head with a sword, just like he said he would. And perhaps that verse is more the stuff of nightmare than children's bedtime story. The story of David and Goliath is a long story. You have just read it with lots of detail, from the location of the battle to the armor and the weapons that Goliath wielded. First Samuel takes a lot of time to fill in this scene. Interestingly, however, Textual critics, those scholars who work to discern the earliest textual traditions in scripture from the later ones, point out a curious fact about this passage. Largely that the version of the Bible Jesus would have read, the Old Testament as we call it now, but the Old Testament that he would have had 2,000 years ago, was missing large chunks of the David and Goliath story. According to Dr. Tim McMinch, Hebrew Hebrew Bible professor at Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis. The Bible Jesus read some 2,000 years ago, the one the early church would have had, probably had a much shorter version of the story in it. Now, scholars agree that this can be explained by one of two ways. Either the scribes that produced the version of the Greek Old Testament, what we call the Septuagint, left out or deleted some of the details from 1 Samuel 17, Or, 
These details were added in later, as we know it today. The general consensus among these biblical scholars is that these sections that were missing from the Septuagint were added later, as late as 700 years after the time of King David. They surmise that these verses, most of them that we read today, came from a different version of the David and Goliath story that circulated separately from the Bible over the centuries. It's fascinating, really, that this is just one of the examples of how the Bible we have today is the product of many generations of scribal framing and updating and addition. So what was added? The parts of our story that talk about David as a shepherd boy who came into battle by chance and happens to hear Goliath's taunt. The version of the story where David is a nobody from nowhere. Those are just the little details that are left out. This is all in contrast to another version of the scene we find in the Old Testament in which David's not a simple shepherd boy, but a grown man and a commander in Saul's army. Now, does this make this section of scripture any less important? Any less inspired? Certainly not. But it does add nuance, and it begs us to dig a little deeper. It makes us want to wrestle with the text and to want to know more and to be reminded that this is the living word of God. So knowing that these little details were inserted makes us want to ask a very good question. Why? Why was more detail added to the biblical tradition long after the text was originally written? What was happening in the world for this addition to the David story to be inserted to be so important anyway? It must have been incredibly important to the community that wove in this second thread. This thread that David encountered Goliath not as a senior military man, but as a poor young shepherd, unknown to the royal court. There must have been good reason to emphasize that God's help can come from those outside of the established power, even from those who appear on the surface meek and unimpressive. This move likely represents an historical moment when the Jewish people felt their own smallness and powerlessness in the face of an overwhelming giant, perhaps like the Greek or Roman empires. Goliath is dressed in Greek military garb, for what it's worth. By holding up their own communal struggle alongside the legend of a beloved hero, the young, unassuming David, the story reveals that outward appearance is in everything. It's a reminder that the people of God have an invisible ally who will support them even in the face of overwhelming odds. I forgive the scholarly shift, but one of my favorite books to read to our daughter Eleanor is a children's book by Helen Lester called The Way for Wadney Watt. And the story centers around a young rat, it's hard to see in the back, around a young rat who's named Rodney Rat, and Rodney cannot pronounce his R's, and the other rodents in class sometimes tease him. One day a new student arrives in school. Her name is Camilla Capybara, and she is huge, and she is mean, and she is a bully. And on the very first day of class, she makes sure everyone knows that she is louder, meaner, smarter, tougher than anyone else who is there. And right away, everyone is afraid of her, even the teacher. Finally, one afternoon, during a rousing game of Simon Says, it becomes Rodney's turn to play Simon. As you remember, Rodney cannot say his R's, and all of his old classmates know this, so they know how to listen and translate what he's saying. So when Rodney says... Simon says, go wake the leaves. They all know they're supposed to pretend to rake the leaves. But Camilla Capybara tries to wake up the leaves and to her embarrassment yells at the leaves to wake up, leaves. And over the next several pages, different commands starting with the letter R ensue and Camilla gets every single one wrong until the final command when Rodney finally says, Simon says, go west. Now, all of his old classmates know that he means go rest, and they pretend to take a nap. But Camilla Capybara geographically figures out which direction is west and heads off into the sunset on and on, never to be heard of or seen again. <laughs> and that is how Rodney Rat becomes the school hero. 
The whole class rejoices with him, and his one little word, West, fells a mighty giant. Hooray for Rodney Rat. Now, as Rodney Rat or any school-aged child can tell you, no one wants to fight a bully, especially a big bully. Goliath was humongous. Standing in this version nearly 10 feet tall, he was a sight to behold. Clad in armor and as loud as a foghorn, it is easy to see why he was intimidating. Every morning he came out and yelled at the Israelites to send out one of their own to fight him, but there were never any takers. This went on for 40 days, a number that is almost always significant in scripture, and despite their shame, no one in the Israelite army could muster their courage. Intimidation, sheer volume can be a powerful tool. If you can make those around you believe that they don't have what it takes to stand up to you, you can boss around a whole class, a whole school, or an entire army. Anna Carter Florence writes that perhaps the story is so beloved by many of us because we know Goliath well. He shows up in our workplaces and at our schools and communities, and he stomps his foot and he shakes his fist and he yells at us. He bellows about everything, how small we are, how unprepared we are, how untalented we are, how unimportant we are, how unfit we are. And if he can provoke us to meet him on his own level, returning violence for violence, rather than the word of God, he knows he'll have us. Goliath is a stand-in for the enemy we face, and he must be defeated, but not on his own terms not with a battle he longs for, not with his own spears and swords. As Carter Florence puts it, we fight back with the word of God, which is all any of us has to fight with in the end anyway. The liberating, life-giving, body-redeeming word of God. We meet it in scripture, and with God's help, we speak it. When justice comes to earth, when the oppressed go free, it will not be with Goliath's weapons. It will be with the word, sharper and stronger than any sword, with proclamation in all its forms. So how do we stand up to Goliath's noise and bluster without losing heart? Anna Carter Florence argues that we ought to take a cue from our younger friends. Adolescents have a daily experience in the subject of bullies. They know what Goliath sounds like, looks like, smells like. They know how close they can get to him before he roars. And they're also developmentally programmed to overestimate their own strength. David was perfect for this match. An adolescent at the peak of his idealism will believe himself capable of felling a giant. A teenager, David, who weighs less than Goliath's armor, will dare to take him on. It's the gift of youth. And many of us would do well to reclaim it when our own courage falters. Shepherding is brave and dangerous work. Young David has been learning all kinds of survival skills out in the wild. He's not frightened by lion or bear. And he's shocked to learn that no one in Saul's army has stepped up to meet Goliath head on. If God is for him, who can be against him? None of the grown-ups in this story expect David to live. That is there age-related challenge. We adults are developmentally programmed to be very realistic. But thankfully, we know how the story goes. David fells Goliath with one well-aimed stone. He does it without the trappings of grown-up warfare. He won't wear the armor that isn't his. He won't carry weapons he doesn't know. He simply goes to meet the giant with what he knows. Small stones from the river a slingshot, and the word of God. Sometimes the humblest, most basic things are all we need to silence a loud giant. So back to the question I posed at the beginning. Why did this story and these details matter to Israel? Why would they be sure to include it? Perhaps for the very same reason that we read it to our children and that we consider it here today. 
It's a story the people of God need to remember and relate to. It's a story that reminds us that God's help can come from unexpected places. It's a story that tells us that outward appearance isn't everything. It's a reminder that we have an invisible ally who loves and supports us. And whenever we're intimidated by the bullies of this world, we need to reread this story. If we listen to Goliath, he will always win. If we put on armor that isn't ours, we won't get far. The way to fell a giant is with a well-placed word of truth. As the young David puts it, the Lord does not save by sword and spear. The word of the Lord stands forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. Second Presbyterian, finding direction by following Jesus.